This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers. I am ready when you are. Right, at 6.01, I will now call to order the July 10th meeting of the East Hampton Conservation Commission. This meeting is being recorded. This meeting of the East Hampton Conservation Commission will be conducted in person and simultaneously via remote participation online to the greatest extent possible. Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so despite best efforts, we will post on the City of East Hampton website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Should an interruption occur in which the online meeting ends abruptly, both the in-person and online meetings will not be restarted and all agenda items will be automatically continued to the next scheduled meeting. Now, I know you have some other housekeeping on this over. Yeah, so hi everybody. Thanks for coming. I see familiar faces out there, but I changed the meeting procedures a little bit with some new technology in here and I wanted to give an explanation of how this is going to work into the future. So. Um, this is still the same. The general procedure of the meeting is that the chair will open each item. The applicant will give their presentation. Then the commissioners will ask their questions and then we'll open up a public comment. And then there's three ways that people can make public comments. Hold on, I'm just gonna admit this person. There's three ways that people can make public comments. You can do it here in person. And you just come up to the podium after the chair opens it up and uh, make your comments right here. And then you can also, if you're for the people who are online, you can use the raise hand function. Down at the bottom of the screen in the control panel, there's a little hand. If you click that, it'll put you at the top of the queue. And then I'll be able to keep track of everybody who needs to be called on. Um, all the people online are muted and their camera is off for now. But once we get to the comment part, we'll turn that features, those features back on for you once you're called on. Um, and then also I just want to remind everybody that at any time you can submit a written comment. Um, and then if that, those will be read into the record at the next meeting. And let's see, please keep your comments to around five minutes. If you want to go longer than five minutes, just get back in line. You can make multiple comments. We just want to make sure everyone gets a turn. And the last piece is also for the commissioners. Um, please try to speak in the microphone. These new microphones, it sounds like everyone's turned them on. They're really direct. And we want to make sure everyone can hear us and that the recording is clear for everyone who isn't here who wants to watch it later and also for members of the audience if you could avoid shouting out it'll make the recording it'll make it harder for me to take the minutes but also will make it harder for the recording to be clear for folks who aren't here to watch it later um, but if anyone has any questions you can always reach out to me too my contact information is on the agenda which is in the back there but that's all i have so if the chair wants to carry on with the rest of the meeting i appreciate your time and I think the intent of having everyone who is in person use the podium is to make sure we're picking that up with the mic for the people online as well, correct? correct. Yeah. So that is, that is a change from how we've done things in the past. That's correct. Uh, all right. Are there any public concerns on agenda items? Hearing none. We'll move on to public hearings, the first of which is. Uh, the public hearing for notice of attempt filed by Thorough Engineering on behalf of TST Top Development LLC for a new mixed use commercial and residential development with associated stormwater management system at 9395 and 97 Northampton Street, map 128, lot 112, 113, and 114. This is map TEP file number 151032. This item has been uh, continued for a number of weeks now while we were getting a peer review um, of the project. And we did receive that initial peer review back last Friday. Uh, the commissioners have had a chance to start looking at that, but we did not ask the peer reviewer to come tonight because we haven't had time to review it in full yet. So we'll be taking a closer look at those comments and we'll ask them to come to a future meeting to present them in more detail. But I understand there's also been some changes made by the applicant in the meantime. Uh, correct. Um, I am the Dean of the Visual Office of the Program of Engineering. You're representing the applicant, Casey Tower Bowling, LLC. So we did receive uh, comments on Friday, and we'll be able to work through um, putting together the responses to those comments in the next meeting. Um, we hope to have a response to the Dean's um, comments so that they will be able to have a response and any follow up comments uh, for the next meeting. Um, 
We did submit an updated set of plans uh, to the Commission a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is because there were some significant plan changes as a result of going through the planning board process. Um, uh, right now, I'll just go through um, all the, the changes and uh, just how they have impacted the, the project. And um, Cassie, can you do you have these same graphics that we can pull up online? I do. Hold on, just a second. Go back. I also have a copy of the commission of the review comments. If anyone wants a hard copy, I'll open it. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. These are the comments. Luke, when you speak, sorry, that microphone is really strong. If you can try to keep away from it so it doesn't echo too much, hopefully that will help. Thank you for the comment in the chat about that. Hopefully that will make it better. Okay, let me share my screen real quick. Ready when you guys are. Um, so yeah, first off, uh, we removed 13,600 square feet of retail space from building 14, the building right here. Um, this eliminated the need for any truck loading area behind the building. Um, so there was previously an entrance and exit here for uh, commercial trucks loading and unloading. Uh, so that was removed and turned into green space. Um, perhaps the biggest change would be we removed one of the residential buildings uh, entirely. All associated paved areas, uh, driveway, parking, uh, walkways uh, were all eliminated. Uh, it also eliminated the need for a, a detention base or an infiltration basin back there. Which building number was that? Um, I don't know what the building number is. It's the, uh, I can't tell you right now. I want to say it was building nine. It was the one that was kind of isolated back here with the driveway. Uh, since this is one of the areas that uh, would need to be cleared uh, to construct the building back there, uh, now it doesn't need to be cleared. Uh, so this uh, eliminating this building contributed to the reduction in tree clearing by 1.3 acres. Uh, although we removed uh, a residential building, uh, the number of proposed residential units uh, for the entire project won't change. Uh, the way we did this is the retail space that was removed from this building will receive half those units, and the other half uh, were added to this building, which uh, increased uh, slightly in, in footprint area. <coughs> um, the three residential buildings uh, further to the east here, uh, they were moved uh, 10 to 15 feet to the west. So this one's moved that way, this one's kind of this way, this way. Uh, this removes, slightly reduced the amount of trees that need to be uh, removed in that area, uh, but also moved all three buildings further away from uh, the slopes in the back of the property. Uh, um, the other change, uh, initially two uh, restaurant pad sites were uh, proposed. Um, this pad site uh, was changed to a, a 32, from a 5,500 square foot restaurant pad site to a 3,200 square foot bank use. Um, so there was a little bit of a reduction in retail space there as well. So just to recap the proposed changes uh, and their impacts to the project, uh, tree clearing will be reduced by 1.3 acres, uh, which is 23% less tree clearing than what was initially proposed. Um, on top of this, nearly 200 trees uh, are proposed to be planted uh, throughout the site. Um, also, the impervious area on site was reduced by uh, over half an acre, about 25,000 square feet. 
Uh, so that's kind of a summary of the, the main changes that we've been going through the planning board. I have to take any questions you might have. Are there associated changes to the proposed stormwater system? There will be, yeah. We, we held up on that until we uh, received the peer review because we anticipated uh, some changes uh, coming from that. So we figured it would just be more efficient to, uh, to wait on that. Uh, but we will incorporate all those changes as well into the stormwater. Okay. Other questions from the commission? What is the light? Sorry. What is the light green area in the center? Oh, that's wetland area, EDW and bank area. So it's between the wetland flags is where the wetland is located. Thank you. Right now. Yeah. So my question is, where you move the additional units to that one work that we're looking at? Yeah. That's very close to one of the restoration areas. Right here? Yes. Perfect, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's it moved a little closer to it, yeah. But, there's, but I mean, there's, there's more, there's going to be more people in that building than the other buildings that's closest to a reservation. I don't know if that would be a problem. So that build, we added uh, eight units to this building. So what, what's the total? 26 units in this in this building. Uh, all the other buildings are 18 units. Okay. Will there be any kind of um, fencing around the wetland areas to protect them from people walking through them or? Um, disturbing us. No, no, no fencing around the wetland area is uh, proposed, only around the detection basins. Uh, you know, the majority of the wetland has a, a forested buffer uh, to the wetland area, but no fencing is proposed. No. Oftentimes, the commission is conditioned that monumentation be erected of some kind, just on consistent intervals, so it's not necessarily a fence, but some kind of notification for folks that they're entering the wetland area. So that, since that will be restored as VVW, that would be encompassed within that monumentation if the commission chooses to condition that. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission at this time? All right, so as I said at the beginning, uh, we will be taking a closer look at the comments from Gilles and Thomas. Um, the peer reviewer and anticipate discussing those uh, potentially at the next meeting. Um, Kathy, did you have thoughts on how that is structure? I know that there's information that needs to be passed to bills and comments from some of these most recent changes. The applicant also needs to have some time to take a look at these and think about the responses. Um, do you have any thoughts on how best to set up that timeline? Um. Well, uh, I guess the, one of the questions might be how you guys feel like if, if you would be able to come to the next meeting with that information, with the response, or do you feel like maybe you would need more time if the commission's amenable to continue into the next meeting? Start with, have, you, have you even had a chance yet to really look at the comments and know the answer to that, or do you need more time to process what's in here? We've looked over the comments, yeah. I, I, we, our goal is to have... Uh, the response completed by the end of the week, so hopefully it gives uh, Bills and Thomas enough time to respond before the next meeting in two weeks. Uh, so that would be our preference. Uh, that's, that's what we're going to try to do. Um, so we're not throwing this out too much longer. What would be helpful, maybe, as a good kind of compromise, or I don't know if that's even the right word, is if you find out you don't think you're going to meet that deadline, if you could let me know the Thursday before so I can give the commissioners a heads up not to expect and some of the folks who have been interested in following it 
to know that you won't be presenting that day. That would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, and then for the, the, I don't know if you were asking about how it should be formatted for their response, but I was expecting kind of just each item because it's numbered, all of their comments are numbered to just see each item addressed directly would be very helpful in my opinion. I agree. All right, and so if we receive that from you by this Friday, then we'll be able to reach out to Fields and Thomas from their timeline for reviewing the responses and uh, hopefully be able to know by early next week when they'll be able to have full responses and if we can expect to discuss that on the 24th or if we'll need to push it out further. That yes. sounds like a good plan. And so Patsy will be in touch with you about that timeline. So we know if we're able to have that discussion at the next meeting or if we need to continue. Sounds good. Um, did we also, I believe in the updates, uh, I also read that the that you have at this point submitted your MEPA application. I believe so. Um, yes. Yeah, I was I was uh, CC'd on the submission email, so I think that that is correct that it has been submitted. But I don't know that any review has started or anything on their end. I'm not as familiar with the process of when they would start at the MEPA office. So that's something that's come up a number of times at previous meetings. Uh, we knew that this project would trip a MEPA threshold because of the degree of impervious cover that's added and the fact that it ties into a DOT operated roadway. Um, and for just general public interest, the MEPA process we have mentioned before is an opportunity that comment is opened up on a wider variety of environmental issues. Uh, and all of the state agencies weigh in at that point, and there's opportunities for the public to weigh in as well. So uh, that information is available through what's called the Massachusetts Environmental Monitor webpage, and I'm sure Kathy can provide uh, assistance if anybody is looking for that and can't find it as well. So know that that process is now going on simultaneously. Yeah, please feel free to reach out to me if anyone wants more information about that. Uh, and then if there's no other comment from the commission, I want to open it up for any public questions or comments. Yeah. Um, so, okay, thank you. I see some hands up in the queue online. I think what makes sense is to do in person first. So people can come up to the podium if Julie agrees and then we can do the online folks. You'll stay in the queue. So as long as you raise your hand once, we got you in there. Um, and then I also received two written comments since the last meeting. If you want to read these first or at the end. Uh, let's hold those in the end. Okay. If you want to come on up to the podium and introduce yourself, please do. And if anyone else in the room wishes to make a comment, you can go ahead and just line up. Mary Lou Dodge, uh, Four Monks Avenue. Just a quick question for developers. Um, how many acres of trees are currently estimated to be removed? Let me check up to the mic very please. I believe the, the previous, sorry, I should know those numbers. I apologize. Um, I believe the previous number was 5.7 acres, and the, the reduction of uh, 1.3 acres is four, between 4.3 4 and 4.4 acres. I can, I can get a final answer. Garrett Stewart, Scum Conservation Trust. Um, I'll be very quick. Uh, in reference to the changes that have been made to the plan, um, we appreciate every inch of uh, distance from the sensitive resources, but I noticed that the residential building that was used was just actually one of the least sensitive locations in terms of both. Uh, habitat, the river, and in terms of its vulnerability to the effects of uh, erosion and uh, steep banks. Um, there are other buildings we would love to see committed. Um, so we, we did, as everybody, we had just a few days to look at the the Thomas report, and uh, we appreciate that there are a lot of specific issues that they pointed out. 
many of them are both technical and far too technical to be able to judge. Um, but they do know that there are a number of aspects that have potential for um, of damaging um, impacts on the habitat and also in terms of things like slope stability. And uh, one point I would make is that there are enough of those items um, cited that one wonders about the people that impact on all these issues. Um, so we'd like to see them resolved. And the particular resolving in, uh, in line with best management practices, which is one of the points I've made. And they do observe, I think it was on the first or the second page, that the main editors are reassuring and therefore particularly sensitive to impacts on development. Um, so we reiterated. Again, our general points that the area along the Manhattan and the river itself are of great ecological importance. There are sensitive resources in that respect, but they're also sensitive in that the soils, the slopes, and the waters are vulnerable to damage. Um, this is definitely true in today's climate, and we mean both today in a larger sense, but also today, literally. Um, pointed out before that the main hand river is location is very dynamic. And buildings are still very close to slopes that are probably going to be much closer or in the river in the next decades. But we are encouraged to see that the review is very detailed and comprehensive. And uh, we hope that that's a scene and they are assigned both to the commission and the applicant. Consider and respond to those points, both specifically. Thank you. Are there any other comments in the room? All right, Cassie, do you want to uh, start with the yeah. online? Yeah, okay. Hold on a second, everybody. Okay, so first in line, I have Marty Klein. Marty, hold on just a second. I'm going to make it so you can talk. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself and turn your camera on if you like, but it's not required. Um, given the, the changes that have been made, um, can you tell us what the total of impervious area is now? Was everyone able to hear that, Ari? I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I can. Can you go up to the microphone? I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I can get that um, with the permission of anybody. Okay. I will note that it should also be in the storm the updated stormwater report on this and that all that information will be in there as well. All right, Marty, do you have anything else to add? Uh, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, next person. Patty C, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Hi, thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, I just want to reiterate what a previous person in the room asked about the acreage that's left of the trees being cut down. They said there's 1.3 acres less that are being cut down, but how many are being cut down? It disturbs me that we're cutting so many trees. We just experienced a very tough time because of wildfires up in Canada and I had issues breathing air, which we need our trees to continue to clean our air. Um, it's getting worse. The greenhouse effect is getting worse. Global warming is getting worse. We have to really start trying to conserve our trees. And I hope our conservation commission really looks at that for our health and our safety. I understand we need progress, but not at the extent of human beings. Um, also, he talked about the restaurant being removed and a bank being um, put in its place. But when I looked at the picture, all I saw were parking spaces. So I'm not sure how that's going to help um, 
our conservation because it looks like it looks like it's primarily hardtop now, which is not conservation friendly. Um, also, they, he talked about the entrance being a green area. I'd like to know what that green area comprises. What is it? Grass, trees? What is that? I don't understand what he meant by the entrance is now going to be a green area. So if he could expand on that. Um, also, I abut the stream that flows into this property. I live on Maxine Circle, which is behind CVS, and we have a stream. I abut wetlands. I have I've been before the Conservation Commission when a solar farm went behind us. Um, wetland living near wetlands is a problem. It really is, and I hope you look at that. Um, we, as we continue to get more rain, I lose more and more of my backyard to wetlands. Our water table is increasingly, it's getting higher all the time. I now have a garden sitting in about probably six inches of water right now. I'm going to lose my garden. So I think you really need to consider these wetlands that are abutting them, how to protect them and protect the people that are living near them. Um, I really hope that our Conservation Commission, you guys are really looking at this because we all do have to live together. Our wildlife has to live with us. I have bears knocking on my back door and I'm not exaggerating. I've never seen that. I've lived in this house over 30 years now in Maxine Circle. I've never had a bear come to my back door. That happened this year. They're hungry, they're losing space. So please consider our wildlife when you're considering this. Consider all of it. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. And Patty, I should have said this at the beginning. Can you please give your full name for the record? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. It's Patty Cavalli. I live at 10 Maxine Circle. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, I'm just taking my notes here. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hold on just a second. And Hey, Lucille Kostick, you can go ahead and unmute yourself whenever you're ready. We can't hear you yet. You might need to um, click the microphone button at the bottom left of the control panel. And if you want to speak but you're still having trouble, you can send me a message in the chat, which is on the bottom right. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Lucille Costic, Plymouth Avenue, in the neighborhood abutting the proposed project. First of all, I want to say the if there's a new phone uh, microphone system, uh, most of the speakers were having great difficulty understanding with loud echoes. The only one that's clear is Cassie Trager. Um, okay. I want to say that. Okay. Excuse me. Oh, sorry, you can go ahead. Um, I want to mention again, uh, I've said this before, uh, the older homes in this neighborhood, including ours, which is uh, dated as being built in 1900. Um, we get water in the basement. We have field stone foundation and others in the neighborhood uh, also get lots of water in their backyards, front yards, whatever. We have a high water table here, and I'm truly worried about this project being at a higher elevation uh, with the downslope to the river where our neighborhood is. They're all the rain we're getting this week, it's it's just terrible. Um, you should see the dam behind our house at, at the Manhan River. The water is going over the top of the dam, over the highest cement abutment. Um, it's just unbelievable. On the news today, they're talking about not only just 100 year uh, flood rainstorms, they mentioned in parts of New York and New England are getting 1,000 year rainstorms. I just am worried that these detention or retention basins that they're putting in are not gonna, um, not gonna work and um, they're gonna overflow and it's all gonna go down through our neighborhood into the Manhan River. 
down through the nice um, farmland of um, Jane Seltzer. And um, I just hope the Conservation Commission uh, really considers uh, what what's happening here. And um, I just want to let you know I'm just concerned. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for that explanation of the echo. I apologize, folks, this is the first day we've been using it, but I will investigate that for the next meeting. Thank you. Okay, we have another person, hold on. Okay, Patty Caval, you can go ahead again. You may need to unmute yourself. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, Lucille brought up another, when she was talking about the runoff going in down through the farmland and I, the way this land sits, I think it's going to affect, this runoff could affect so many more neighborhoods. I mean, you have Highland on one side, you have Northampton Street and us on the other because we are, we're the wetlands that are part of that. So I, Lucille has a very good point that I never thought of. Sorry that I never thought of, that it will be many neighborhoods that I believe that could be affected by runoff. Because for every building you put in, you are decreasing land, land space. Excuse me, I need to let my dog out. Go. You're reducing land area to absorb water. So you're pushing all that water into our areas. So like Lucille said, we already have issues um, who's going to be there for us when our issues become to the point where we can no longer live in our homes? Because now I'm really concerned, thanks to Lucille. So thank you, Lucille. And I, again, hope you really think about this. Thank you. Um, hold on just a second, everybody. I am not seeing any other hands raised in the queue. Again, if anybody has any other comments they want to make, you can just click that button there. I'll be able to see you or if anyone else is in person. Otherwise, I can read the written uh, comments that I got for. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Carr. I have a question that arose in response to one of the comments. I don't know if I should say that to the end. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, when you talked about the Somebody mentioned the loading dock being replaced by green space. Um, if, does that reduce the impervious area because you're adding green space and removing paved? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, and uh, I believe she, uh, one of the, the commenters, was asking about what that green space would entail. Um, it'll be because the retail space was uh, taken away and how it'll be um, apartment units. Uh, a, a <laughs> so this is where the impervious uh, area was taken away for the loading and unloading. It's not the entrance to the building, it's actually the back of the building. Um, so now that these are all, all going to be apartments, uh, we thought it would be necessary to, to have screening trees um, between the, the driveway here and the people's windows in the back of this building. So it will primarily be the grass area and screening trees to be able to consist of. Yeah, I know you didn't know the total amount of the impervious area, but if you add up that green space with the footprint of the building that was removed, how much impervious area does that reduce approximately? Uh, 25,000 square feet. Thank you. Yeah. And that takes into account the, the added footprint of this building. Oh. Thank you. Hold on just a second. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised here online. And if everybody's okay in person, then I will read the comments that I received since the last meeting. Uh, let's see. Okay. This, this comment was received from uh, Marion Groves on June 8th, 2023. 
uh, and it says, this is the second letter I've sent to the planning board. I am sending it to you as well. Dear board members, it is difficult to understand that there is such a focus on the almighty dollar before considering the obvious threat to our environment, quality of life, and future generations. Are the board members East Hampton citizens? Please think of the long-term implications of this proposed massive and permeable grouping of asphalt, <coughs> excuse me, concrete, cars, and consumers. Our water supply is the most precious asset we possess. Please listen to the concerns of those who wish to protect and preserve nature. Once it is gone, it's gone. There will come a time, unless we gain control, uh, excuse me, gain legal control and preservation of our water, farmland, and environmental assets, that the quality of life in this city will diminish exponentially, will diminish exponentially. Wake up and look at the facts. Think of the generations to come. Respectfully, Marion Groves. And then the second comment received was from uh, Natanya Hume, received on Monday, July 3rd, 2023. To whom it may concern, I've been a resident of East Hampton since 2004, and in that time, the town has changed enormously. Much of the change has been good. With new interesting restaurants, fun little shops, and lots of people moving to the town because of its convenient layout, natural beauty, and artistic and cultural growth. However, the Tasty Top development will threaten and quite possibly ruin much of what eat people love about East Hampton. The town cannot support a development of that size without repercussions. It is out of out of proportion for the size and tenor of the town and threatens the creative and intellectual culture which has so successfully developed here over the last decade. This smacks of a plan that is in the best interest of a few while ignoring the welfare and well-being of the many. It will tax the resources of the town and its people and change the character of it forever. I am wholly against this development and would instead endorse a much smaller plan that is responsible and sensitive to the land, the town, its people, and its history. And then there's the signature at the end is sent from my iPhone, which is sometimes less grammatically correct than I am. And those are the only written comments thus received. Um, and any new written comments will be read at the next meeting. Thank you, Kathy. So with that, I think if there are no further comments, we will uh, close the hearing for this evening, most likely to be uh, opened again on July 24th. But as we discussed, if we know in advance that there's going to be a continuation requested, we will do our best to let people know so that they're not um, coming to the meeting if this is the only item they're interested in. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Do we have to make a motion to continue? Thank you. Yes, thank you, mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to uh, continue to July 24th at 6 p.m. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor, roll call votes. Uh, we? Aye. August? Aye. Patrick? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Carr? Aye. Whittemore? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always see a order on me. And folks intend is just to try to sign in when you leave if you haven't already. Thank you. If you're, if you're not saying Our next item is a public meeting uh, for a request for determination of applicability filed by Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary for installation of a new accessible ramp at 127 Combs Road, which is map 107, lot one. Um, Kathy, does this have a item number? No. no. Okay. <clears throat> Hi. Do I have someone here to speak for this item? Please uh, step up to the party and then introduce yourself for the record. My name is Trevor Culbers. I'm here for uh, representing Ann Arlon at uh, 127 Columbus Road. My name is Wayne Avery. We are, are hoping to build a ramp that connects our Paul Parsons Trail off the back of our building over an existing uh, trail. It's uh, within the wetland buffer zone. Um, the ramp itself is uh, supposed to be 16 feet long. Um, and we're attempting to completely minimize ground disturbance. Uh, which is why we want to use diamond piers. Um, I can explain this if you'd like. <laughs> Just going. I think probably most of us are familiar with the concept. Cool. Um, 
and then uh, the five foot by five foot area at the end of the ramp that needs to be flat to meet all acceptable course. And that's more or less it. And you said the total length is what again? 16 feet. Okay. So 16 plus the five. Yes, the ramp is 16 feet and then five additional feet. Um, needs to be flat area, which is mostly flat air already. So again, this is going to be very, very uh, What kind of equipment will you need to bring in to install this? Shovel. <laughs> um, no heavy equipment at all? No. Okay. No. Um, let me just take a second. Uh, first thing you power show and standard, you know, tools that we would carry in. Uh, and sometimes we would use our uh, tractor for moving a bunch of stone. But in this case, um, so yeah, well, And there's no machinery that comes in to install the gear to put by hand. Oh yeah, no, it's done by hand. Okay. Um, it'll need a. Uh, I don't know what it is. I've never done it before. It's, it's some sort of hammer that drives the pin through the concrete into the ground. Not heavy machinery, no. No, it's the smallest. I believe it's the smallest of the diamond piers. Okay. Catherine, did you pick up the site visit? I did. Um, Any observations to share? Not really. I, uh, I'll share these pictures from their filing, which are similar to the pictures that I got. I had some phone troubles when I did the site visit, so their pictures are better, frankly. Um, yeah, I took those pictures. Yes. <laughs> Um, but as you can see, there's basically kind of already a little bit of a path worn down. There's still some some of the fabric that was used for the original trail path there is still there underneath the grass a little. And this is it extending, looking from where it's coming from. But this area is within the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, and I believe it's, I don't know if it's within the floodplain, it's just really close to the floodplain. It's really close. Yeah, but I don't think it's in it necessarily. But, no, um, so I was working with Tom lots of times and um, identifying that because this year, but we all know he's very by the book and wants to make sure we're always doing it right. So I actually got to learn some stuff from him. We went out there together to mark where the uh, floodplain is. Sorry, I'm getting on track here. It's very good. This is my first one. <laughs> and everything will be, um, as we can see from the picture, within existing maintained lawn areas. So there's no vegetation clearing. Correct. Yeah, it, it more or less follows that little dirt path, which is used to be stone and fabric under the stone. The grass, as we know, just always takes over. Um, so, yeah, what do you see there? It'll just be a, a 16 foot foot. Yeah. Questions from other members of the commission? Is the permanent? Yes. Well, maybe this is something you can permanent, but yes. Okay. And you're not using any stones. You said they're, they're worse. So, if you were to remove some of the debris that's thrown in, there's still stone under everything. It's just over the years, all the you know, tree leaves and grass plants, greater soil. You're not adding anything. Uh, well, I don't anticipate to add any stone, but that flat, possibly on that flat area, because we need to make sure that we're following uh, the code for when a the uh, wheel device leaves the ramp. You have to have a five foot, foot square that's flat. And in order to achieve that, 
um, we could, I guess, do it in a number of ways, but one of the ways would be stone, another would be just shaping the air, which would, in that uh, area, it's already, like I said, very flat, so it wouldn't be doing much more. So no stone. I think I feel like the description maybe cited stone. Let me double check because I know you guys send in a written description as well. And I can't remember. What is that? It just references leveled ground. There will be a five foot by five foot, 24 square foot landing area, parentheses, leveled ground at the base of the ramp. It does mention the potential removal of the existing stone needed, presumably to get the tears uh, into the ground that was mentioned. Yeah, that makes sense because right now it's only serving the water from the top. So the Perhaps to get back to where that stone is. So we could we could reclaim the stone. <laughs> it's already there. I won't bring in any more. Thank you. Kathy, based on um, what's down gradient and the slopes, do you recommend anything particular in terms of the erosion controls moving to keep place? Do you have any concerns there? Well, I know like there's gonna be very minimal ground disturbance, but a potential little bit of soil. Do you think it would be within the capacity of the project to just do a line of, of wattle or something just on that down gradient side, just because there is going to be a little bit of disturbed soil? Sure. That would be my only recommendation. Yeah. So is that one of our conditions then? Could be. Any other questions? Do you have a particular kind of wattle that you prefer? Because I know that there are options. I would say um, in this instance, probably a straw bottle would be sufficient or you know, anything that functions similarly, but a straw bottle is probably going to be your most cost-effective option since we don't have, we don't need something heavy in this case to really make the things down since there's not a significant load. Yeah, yeah. Just staking it into the, a regular straw bottle would be, I think, acceptable. Yeah, that's what we did in this Okay. I have no other comments or concerns. <clears throat> so, we invited to make a motion. Uh, we would be looking at a negative determination. <laughs> Number three, that the work described is in the buffer zone as defined in the regulation, but will not alter an area subject to jurisdiction. And then that does allow us to have conditions. So I'll make a motion that we issue a negative determination. A negative determination number three on the wobble describes our standard conditions. Standard conditions would be 48 hour notice. Second. All those in favor? Weeks? Aye. August? Aye. Butcher? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Clark? Aye. Portamore? Aye. Motion carries. I'm second to put. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, thank you. All right. So if you give us just a few moments, we'll get the paperwork scattered for you. Sorry. If you give us just a few moments, we can get the paperwork scattered for you. Mm -hmm. I'll be off then. Good. Thanks. You know what? I have to photocopy it, and I don't want y'all to wait while I run downstairs. Can I email it to you, slash mail it to you? After it's like tomorrow, yeah. if that makes sense. Okay, sorry, I probably wouldn't have to wait. No, I want to go work on it now. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, great, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'll thank be in touch tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Just to pause, folks, while the commissioner signed that document. I well, we said that the forecast is going to get reversed from level for tomorrow. Ties 1953. Oh, and boy. Then, wow. That's um, just the forecast. I wonder if they're going to be closed and um, stop logging across from five. Uh, right. I the ball in the It's probably so long since that was originally done. You know, the people that did it the 30s aren't around anymore that do not put it on together. Almost positive that we're going to answer this test recently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they put it in four years ago. Yeah, they did do it a few years ago, but that was like so many years since then. That was probably the, since the big flood or something. Well, it, it was a flood event. I mean, it wasn't just practice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was a flood event, but probably not like this. Well, Hal finishes up. Um, I was curious if the commission would consider taking an item out of order. Item 6E, which is a lab goal, 6 yeah, if we can, we can get that, just because there's no waiting after, we're going to go back to the regular agenda item. Yeah, we're in 66 in the North End. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Motion to take the 60 out of order. We have a second. Second. All those in favor, please. Aye. All those. Aye. Butcher. Aye. Item 6E, Enforcement Action at Loudville Condominiums, LLC, 6973 Loudville Road, Map 140, 139, Block 28, 29 11. This is Enforcement Order 2023 Yeah, just quickly, I see um, Joseph Kelly and Ryan Nelson are here. I've made it so that you guys can unmute yourself and turn the camera on if you want to. And then I don't know what the last person is a representative of the project or not. I know sometimes people join by phone, but if you are, I can give you those permissions as well. All right, so at our last meeting, which um, no one from the project attended, we required an updated restoration plan to be provided by June 30th. Is that correct, Nancy? Correct. Um, and so I believe we have copies of that here if anyone would like one. Anyone? Yes, if it had the sticking on the front, then yes. Yeah. 
Right, so if someone from the project could please walk us through what we have on this current plan. Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Ryan Nelson from Arlo Vec Associates. Uh, hang on a second, Ryan. We are having a low volume issue. All right, try that, Ryan. Can you hear me now? That's better. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Cassie, do you want me to share my screen or do you have it up on the screen there? Are you guys looking at the plan? They're looking at it here in front of them, but it would be helpful maybe if you could share your screen. It might be better. Sure. All right. Can everyone see that? Not yet. All right. Now it's up. Yeah. Okay. So um, not a whole lot has changed since this first iteration was submitted. Um, this is the BBW restoration area um, at the bottom of the slope. This is our permitted limit of work. This is the steep bank. Uh, this is where the area of scouring and erosion from that pump discharge happened. This is that rivulet that was created. So as part of this revised restoration plan, we're calling for the remainder of sediment in this BVW area to be removed by hand tools and a vacuum, similar to what was already done. Uh, we understand that, you know, part of the organic in the A topsoil horizon may be removed and trying to scrape up every last bit. Um, and then once that is removed, the disturbed soils are, are to be seeded with a wetland restoration mix for shade areas and then also uh, planted with wetland ferns and then um, also with uh, spice bush within this wetland area. And then uh, the stormwater, or I should say the temporary uh, stormwater bypass pipes will remain in place to direct flow, uh, to convey from trying to minimize scouring out this wetland restoration area that would stay in place until this is fully vegetated and stabilized. And same with the silt fence along the perimeter. Uh, then the second half to this restoration is the um, washout of the slope that occurred. And in this area, we're proposing, uh, based on the CONCOM's input the last few meetings, we're proposing uh, compacted lifts to be installed um, to restore this washout to match adjacent existing grade of these undisturbed areas adjacent to it. So the way that would work is we have a detail we've included here. where a biodegradable erosion control blanketing um, or some other approved equivalent that's biodegradable geogrid fabric would be used to wrap uh, soil and then you know go up the slope and lifts and then that that outer face would either be seeded or the soil to be put in there would be impregnated with seeds and also proposing plants to be staked in that exposed face and those plants are um, specified and shown here. Uh, they'd be a variety of upland ferns that Meredith suggested, the uh, previous consultant for the monitoring, as well as um, Eastern hemlock, which is what is already um, a native plant that exists on site there. So in order to um, install this, there is an undermine or a an undercut that has occurred. So that would have to be, the undercut would have to be over excavated out in order for the contractor to properly tie in these lifts into the soil um, and then have room to work also safe, a safe area to work from. So it's anticipated that work would start uh, or, you know, from the top of the existing limit of work and then be placing soil starting at the bottom of that rivulet and then working its way up in lifts and trying to restore a natural grade. Um, so those are the two main components of this plan. Happy to answer any questions. All right, I have a number of questions, Ryan. Let's start with the soil lifts. Um, the plan for the vegetation, looking at your list, you've indicated two to three foot height uh, Eastern hemlock and maple leaf viburnum, which I believe are also in that area. 
And then one gallon Christmas burns. I assume you understand that when you install vegetated soil lifts, you don't want to cut large holes into the material to plant. So the typical is to use gloves and or live stakes. Okay, yeah, we we can substitute that. That's fine with us. So we'll want to see a revised planting list and approach based on that as well as the timeline for doing that. It's typically a time of year that works for live stakes and a time that does not. Okay. Um, who's going to be installing the soil lifts? And can you tell us what their experience with this technique is? Um, Joe or Carlos, do you guys know? Sorry. Is that Carlos as the unknown? I just made it so he can speak if he prefer. Yeah, if Carlos is there, he can better answer that. I'm not sure offhand as we're going through Carlos. On the line. He should have the ability to unmute himself. If I'm sorry. I, yeah, I'm here. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. Go ahead. So the commissioner just part. asked. Yeah, sorry. They had just asked if uh, who would be completing the work and what their experience with such work has been. I, well, we would be doing the work um, specifically this application. We've never done, but we have done plenty of compact lifts and it's um you know it's pretty cut and dry looking at the detail how it's going to get done or how it should be done is the commission comfortable with that um are you going to be able to do all of the work from the top of the slope and reach down to your excavator um, whatever we can't reach with the excavator, I'm assuming we're going to have to probably dig by hand. Um, because the excavator, I don't think it'll reach probably about three quarters of the way down the slope, but the rest we'll probably have to do by hand, uh, caving it in with shovels and stuff. So how will you compact them by hand? Say that again? How will you compact the lids by hand if you're doing hand work at the bottom? Well, a compactor is, we can get a compactor down there. That's different. That's a self-contained unit that I can just, a jumping jack is just something that, you know, I can bring, you know, we can put it on a rope, bring it down there. And as we're uh, building the lifts, we compact each one, uh, you know, then to do the next one, compact that. So the, the compactor is independent of the excavator. Okay. And do you have a, a spec for the replacement soil that you're proposing to bring on to site to fill these with? Excuse me, repeat that. Do you have a spec for the replacement soil that you're proposing to fill the lids with? Uh, well, we have uh, native soil to that area that we were going to use uh, for that area. So, you know, stockpile loom that we already have there. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if that's appropriate for the lips. Can do you know? Um, I would think so. You're going to get out of a lot of different kinds of soils. And if it's, you know, if someone gets a creek, you can down a lot of rocks. Down there. Okay. Do we want to see kind of great analysis or something like that before it's used? Um, I wouldn't think so. I don't know. Okay. It's just stuff that came off the site in different locations, right, Carlos? Correct. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yep. Okay. Any other questions for the commission on the lifts portion? I have, I have one or two, I guess. Um, one is what uh, what lift height is are you using? I didn't see it on the detail. And the other one is um, let's see the detail. The detail calls that an eroding control blanket, uh, but then there's also like some reinforcing the fabric indicated. And I was, I'm, not, I'm not sure that will be necessary, but I'm wondering if that is like a second reinforcing fabric is something planned, and if so, what that would be. Like in the 
detail. Uh, just looking towards the right hand side by the, the second column on the bottom, it says three three inch minimum soil between reinforcements. And there's like kind of like a uh, horizontal line and then a line that kind of like just joins that line, but scoots out a little bit. I'm just wondering if that is that. I wonder what that is. Um, I had trouble hearing or understanding that, but um, I was going. I was going by. I did consult some companies, Filtrex, uh, EJ Prescott, and Springfield, and they all had a common theme in their um, geotextile lifts, and that was they put spacing between um, the fabric returns. And I'm assuming that's for uh, just to provide some stability and friction between the two fabrics, rather than sliding on each other. Oh, okay, gotcha. So we're looking at like the upper fabric and the lower fabric. I right. See. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. I understand sorry. now. Sorry to interrupt. It may help now that there's less people in the audience. Because one of the reasons that we had the microphones was so that people could hear in the audience in the room. It might make it better. It sounds like people are still experiencing an echo if we turn off the microphones. You, I'll still be able to capture your audio for the folks online for the item in the middle of the room. So hopefully that's helpful, Ryan. Okay, let us know if this works better, the same, or worse. Much better. Great. So one of the, the another part of the question was uh, the height of the individual lifts. I would leave that one to Ryan, right? Yeah, I mean, we were showing six inches only because that was what some of the details um, kind of standard I found, but I do realize we have quite a vertical change to go that may seem extremely tedious. So, um, and, you know, I'm not a geostructural engineer, but I would think six inches um, is probably conservative. I would, I would think going greater than that would probably be more efficient. But I mean, we do have like, I don't know, 20, 30 feet of elevation we need to go. So you're doing it six inch lifts. That's, you know, 40 to 60 lifts. Yeah, I missed that. I didn't see that call out. I see it now. Yeah, I think, I mean, six inches is smaller than I have usually seen. Yeah. yeah, that's on the conservative side, I think. Yeah. I would agree that 12 is more typical. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, those are, I mean, those are minor comments. I think this looks uh, like it, like a good detail to me. Um, does do we want to see more specifically the proposed blanket material that's going to be used for the lift? It's listed as kind of a, a couple of four similars. Um, I did, like, you know, I made these out of paper towels before for a class. Just kind of, <laughs> it's kind of hundred percent biodegradable. It's it's doesn't have water flowing against it like in a river it's um a pretty flat slope it shouldn't really matter that much yeah it, in the past i think there was discussion about like the lifespan of the biodegradable does that matter like it, it biodegrades in so many years as a specification yeah i mean i guess that's a good point as, as to how since it's how shady it is how quick those findings will take over as that material biodegrades. I think at minimum we'd want something that's gonna last a few years. We want to stay longer. Um I don't know. Maybe. Ryan, did you in your research get any input as to the longevity for this application of the material and when it should biodegrade? Um, not on the specific kind, no. But any input as to what the recommended lifespan or longevity of the material ought to be in this application? Um, the materials that I was discussing with Filtrex and EJ Prescott um, were all synthetic materials, and I know the commission wanted something biodegradable, so um, I don't really have a 
timeline for that substitute. Okay, so then we are going to want to know more about what specifically you're looking at for material and what its longevity is. Okay, yeah, we called out um, North American Green SC150. It's kind of the standard that you see on a surface application, so I can try and hunt down what the lifespan on that is. Thank you. I mean, I would think, I think a two-year material would be okay, you know? What's, what's the over story of tree plant composition? It's going to drop litter on it and help sort of stabilize, you know, things together, take over. Ryan, what are the remaining overstory trees? Uh, hardwoods, some hemlock. It's the canopy is pretty dense in there, so I don't foresee a lot of sunlight getting in there during the growing season. Birch, maple, hemlock, some oak trees. It's a mix. And while we're on that, are there additional trees that you've identified that will need to come out in order to safely do this work? Um, I believe there's a couple trees that were kind of compromised already or uprooted right on that undercut, but I, no mature trees need to be cut to do the work, no. All right, further questions on the soil lift? Uh, the, live, the live stakes that you're going to be getting, will they all be native and non-invasive? I think they don't even know what the live stakes oh, are going to be because they haven't considered that yet. Okay. But that would obviously be a requirement, Ryan, that they would be native yes. and appropriate to the landscape. Yes, yep. All right, moving to uh, the sediment area at the base. Uh, just sorry, just for, for me. So there's going to be a revised plan submitted for this. Does the commission want me to just make sure that those changes have been implemented or do you want to review it again at the next meeting to your preference? Cassie could review it. Yeah, I think well, Cassie, if you're comfortable. Yeah, we're using you know, native stakes and the, the lifespan of the material is going to be more than two years. It's so more than two years. Sorry. Two years minimum. Two years minimum, mm -hmm. I had. Yeah. I can reach out to you, Julie, if I have questions. Okay. Um, so for the area at the base where additional sediment needs to be removed, um, one thing that I want to note is that you are assuming that additional O and A horizon materials are going to be removed. We are not making that assumption. Our assumption is that you are going to be bringing in different tools and using different techniques as necessary to scoop up the material in a way that is going to disturb as little of the underlying native material as possible. And Cassie's going to be watching that and keeping an eye on the progress and asking you to look for alternatives if that is not working as expected. So I hope that you have some new ideas since previously you had told us that you had kind of met the limit of the tools you had on hand. We use hand tools in a vacuum. I'm not sure what more can be, what, how that can be done in a more gingerly fashion. expectation. This is a problem that you've created for yourselves. No, we're going to we're going to take care to uh definitely going to take care to not disturb any of the underlying material. Um, you know, we what's left we could have taken a little more, but you know, we followed Meredith's suggestion and did not. So I'm thinking we can take a little more by hand. And obviously, as soon as, uh, you know, as far as there's a lot of things popping in there, ferns, skunk cabbage, things like that, uh, you know, we'll stay away from those, obviously. not You're not going to interfere with anything that's uh, already grown up. And, um, you know, and Cassie will be there watching us. So I think between everybody, I think uh, we can, you know, make it acceptable without destroying anything underneath Great, thank you. Yep. 
Uh, does anyone else have comments on the sediment removal piece? Yeah. Well, I would add, so Ryan was, it was helpful. He emailed me today, which I wasn't able to send to you guys yet before the meeting about the current conditions on site due to the draining and flooding. Um, so I don't know if Ryan, you want to give an overview of the conditions out there right now. Sure. So I went out and did my weekly SWIP inspection. Um, and this morning I noticed that the banks of the river, uh, sorry, the, the flow over top the banks of the river on both sides and the river was actually flowing through this whole replication area. There had to be, I don't know, two, three feet of water in this whole floodplain. So just letting the commission know there may be additional deposition that wasn't man caused or there may be scouring. I'm not sure. I can got pictures that I can share or Ryan, if you want to share them. Whoever. You can go ahead and yes, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Okay, sweet. No, I just have the two pictures that Ryan shared. So hold on. Significant. So this is not the, rest, the cleaning area, Ryan, correct? This is like another part of the stream. This is um, standing at the silt fence, looking downstream to where that connection was. Okay, so the silt fence area is behind us. This yep. is the silt fence area. And so, at least for me, it's not clear what the state of it's going to be once the water recedes, sure. which may have impacts for the plant. As the silt fence gap, then, well, all of the silt fence failure has been corrected yet? No, we, we couldn't get to that area to fix them. I hope tomorrow morning we could be able to get over there. And then also, I know we were planning to do that remainder of removal tomorrow morning and starting at 7.30, but it sounds like maybe we should postpone that yet again until the water is fully receded. I don't know how long it will take or how long to guess it would take for the water to recede. Yeah, I was going to play it by ear tomorrow morning. I'm not sure how long. Same thing. I'm not, I, I have no idea if it's going to recede in three more hours or three more days. So well, whatever way. We can, I can plan to show up and just make a call. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or, I need to need a document conditions. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, then, yeah, Carlos, I'll, I'll, if you were planning to be there in the morning around 7 30 still, or whatever time, I can meet you there if you want. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. 7 30. Um, but so I guess it seems like there's two possibilities. As Ryan said, there's either more material may have been deposited there from that from that area, I guess we could guess, or it might be washed away. So I'm not really sure what to expect. Is but, there, so there's that little breach in the silt fence on the down gradient side. Is there any water like that came in over the silt fence or is there any breaches up there? Or is it just kind of like it's filtering through the silt fence to get in? No, the the river totally went through the um, um, west side of the silt fence. So there's that it, the picture doesn't show it, but there was actual velocity, like the river was flowing through oh. this area. Yeah. And then the, you did you you had mentioned in your SWIP report for that day that you did not notice any breaches of the controls above at the main construction site, or? Correct. There's no there was no breaches prior to the storm. So I will plan to go out there tomorrow morning and then update you all. Um, so if it's receded and there's stuff we can do, I, I guess we'll try to do it. And then if there isn't, then we'll just wait. Okay. Cassie, okay. please keep us updated as to what you're seeing for conditions. I'll send pictures in the morning. Thank you. Yeah. Any further comments or questions at this point? Yeah, uh, the erosion control balance. Okay, thanks. 
Um, so, uh, wetland restoration health is sediment removal, maybe in an act of small rubber track machinery. Was that okay? Is that an original? I think that what note is that? Uh, that is number two in the wetland restoration. Ryan, number two on the wetland restoration notes regarding the rubber tracks machinery. I think that's an old note from an earlier version of the plan. Is that accurate? If you're trying to respond, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, that was a prior note from when we thought we were going down that more gradual part of the slope until we had a, the vacuum truck solution. So I can eliminate that note. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Uh, the short term erosion control maintenance number four. Um, we've gone over this a few times. So I don't know if we just didn't fix it, but is it? 0.25 inches or greater, it would require after a storm event. Yeah, that's, I think that's what it says. This is greater than 2.5. Any storm event greater than 0.25 inches? That's right. Isn't it 0 0.25 and greater? That's what it says. Oh, oh, I see. You're saying they're not including. Correct. Yeah. You're saying greater than 0 0.25. So in note four, if you could just update it to say equal to or greater than 0.25 inches. Sure, I can do that. Yep. And I had um, one other question about the shrub planting detail. It says they want to use pine bark mulch. Is that what you use in this particular type of area? And that would be on the bottom. I would not anticipate any mulch to be appropriate in the wetland replication area, um, any commercial type of mulch. You could use leaf litter potentially. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, if you could update please the details uh, to reflect leaf litter rather than pine bark mulch. Sure, yep, we can do that, yep. And you'll add also an appropriate detail for the installation of the live stakes, please, when you provide the updated plan. Yes. Yep. Anything else from the question? Is there any updated information about the in stream? Frustration. Yes, so Cassie and I did speak with Scott Jackson. Um, Cassie, you had some notes. Do you want to give a summary of that conversation? Yeah, so um, yeah, Scott Jackson, UMass Amherst professor um, for wetland science and probably at many other accolades, um, was able to meet with us, which was great. And my notes from that meeting. So what we, the purpose of the meeting was to discuss what options the commission may have available to them in terms of dealing with the final piece of the restoration, which would be mitigating for or remediation in response to the impacts to the stream directly um, in that turbid water was observed entering the stream directly on, on the day of the violation, uh, which is a form of pollution. However, majority of that material has washed away since pretty much immediately. Uh, so my notes from that meeting, hold on. <clears throat> it seemed like it was that long ago. Oh, here we go, okay. Um, so Scott had an interesting point about sediment that has entered the stream, even if it was accumulated in there or um, seems to be, yeah, it was noticeably accumulated, which we weren't able to see it seemed like the majority of it washed down the best practice to kind of fix that would be to allow the stream to kind of erode it away and wash it away as opposed to having equipment come in and try to excavate that accumulated material he referenced experience with uh, division of Eco um, ecological restoration 
in similar things where they have much more uh, larger deposition of sediment within the stream and uh, they, their recommendation in those instances was to let it naturally erode away. Um, but in lieu of that, considering that it is of, oh, sorry, let me just keep going back. So then the other piece of it was that, is there any kind of like assessment that we could do of the stream to see how it may have be impacted since that turbid water entered? Previously, we were thinking maybe we would do some kind of assessment upstream and then compare to downstream. But he cautioned that without an original baseline understanding of the stream, the conditions may just be different. We wouldn't want to make changes to the stream from what was originally there if it's been able to kind of revert back. It's not clear if we could figure that out accurately enough. We don't want to do something that's going to change conditions there in a way that it had never been necessarily. Um, but in lieu of all that, it's still there was a violation that happened and that was an impact. It was an impactful thing that did happen. Um, and so he was talking about maybe there was some other way that there could be a net benefit produced for that area as kind of compensation, I suppose, is the best way to say it for that impact that did happen from the water just entering the stream. And that's where it kind of was a question of, well, what would that be? So you could have a group come and do an assessment of the whole quarter of that area and try to figure out what is the condition of the stream generally before or after just right now? What is the condition of it? How could it be improved to get this net benefit? He mentioned potentially their recommendations could be found to do some kind of rewooding of the stream or maybe invasive removal kind of in kind or some amount that was comparable to um, the amount of turbid water that may have entered the stream. But that's where it's, this is where it's kind of turned to the commission of what they think would be appropriate um, because it's not as clear as simply cleaning up as it is for the sediment removal and the slope restoration. And I don't know if I'm missing anything else, Julie, please. I think that's uh, the gist of it. One other factor, of course, is ownership of that corridor and where we would or would not be able to actually do some sort of restorative improvement activity. Um, but I think at least a section of that is PCG property. So we would likely have a cooperative partner if we wanted to do improvement actions as part of the mitigation for this violation. Um, yeah, I was wondering if um, there's any way to assess like the fish in the stream or the frogs to see if there's any damage to them from the sediment like and their tissues or lungs apart from the water itself. It's because just hard without having the base information of what it was like before because we don't have data to compare to a to set of metric for them to achieve, if that makes sense. Well. Yeah, I mean, I would think if you found a bunch of sediment in a frog's lungs, that that wouldn't be normal, right? Like, that probably wouldn't be baseline. I don't know. I don't want to impose something that's unfair, but the, what you were talking about in terms of a compensatory action all seem to be on the banks, like woodland or invasives, but I don't know how that helps the actual wildlife that might have been injured or so. What Cassie it. references rewooding the stream would be adding large wood to the stream. Oh, okay. So that it flows, flows, allows for more natural sediment accumulation processes. So that would be an in stream improvement. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I guess I just was curious if this uh, person that you talked to had anything to say about assessing the wildlife themselves but, or the biological organisms apart from the environment. Yeah, My, basically that without a baseline, you don't impact. have anything to okay. go off of to measure the impact. In terms of, you know, looking at frogs and fish also, I don't know if we would want to have them go, you might have to kill them to figure that out if they are yeah, with something like bad. Water conditions today. Yeah. Look at the condition of that water today. That's crazy. Yeah, the, the sediment load that that river is carrying now right, right is now like ridiculous. hundreds of times probably what happened uh, to the parts of that activity. It's just kind of part of the part of the uh, process that a river has to go through. Okay. Thank you. This is a nice looking river corridor, so. All right, did you want to comment? Yeah, I have 
And could I ask you to go to yes. the podium for us on that? You on could. The <laughs> and I will come back. Um, yeah, you know, we don't have any habitat um, organism census in there. And a few elsewhere. And I can actually look back and see because um, um, we did have a uh, naturalist many years ago who did an assessment of the conservation areas, not necessarily streams specifically for that. Um, my my overall observation would be that uh, you know, there is a pretty level stream so that I don't think the conditions are radically different upstream of this point of the incident, downstream of it. Um, I know that there, there definitely was sediment, you know, sandy sediment that was quite different from the organic soils that characterize most of the stream bed and before this. Um, and it does seem to me, and, oh, the, the other thing was that um, I don't remember a lot of obstacles. It's not like the Manan River in terms of you know, a lot of down trees, and that kind of habitat. Um, so I'm not sure that that treatment would necessarily be inappropriate. Um, I guess generally, you know, anything that does um, ameliorate some of the general issues which are everywhere in terms of invasives um, would be probably helpful uh, if there's something that that's good that long lasting. Um, the only other thing that that's come to mind is there are landowners on the opposite bank. Um, that this is where that is now developed. I think there are some further downstream, and perhaps there's um, some kind of protection or improvements um, on the other bank that might be possible. This coming, of course, is ready for the Thank you. So, is the commission interested in pursuing some sort of assessment to identify additional restoration actions that could be done? We could either look at this as uh, just just requiring as the mitigation um, funding that planning process, or we could look at the mediation as funding the planning process and implementation of some action that comes out of it. We kind of take one of two levels of that. That question makes sense. This is Ryan. Can I can I say something? I'd like to hear from the commission first, please. I agree with this. Go ahead. I I also agree that an assessment would be helpful. I think it should be in the context of you know the rainfall events of the last couple of days. This very possibly could be a significant enough natural disturbance that it's going to force us to rethink what's an appropriate step in the light of the, enforce the context of the enforcement action that we're contemplating. Uh, just for example, there may be deposition of natural sediments on top of the foreign sediments in that depositional area. And we need to ask, are we going to do more harm than good? by having some of those foreign sediments removed in light of so, so, so I think the context of the assessment is an important consideration here. Maybe we should wait until we see what happens when the water goes down and see what the condition of the site is. I, I lean in that direction to a site visit and make a, make a choice. I think that's a very valid point. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna um, so when we talk about information that's currently available, I would, uh, I found that Mass Wildlife often has, you know, information on uh, fish populations going back, uh, you know, and may not be consistent, but they might have sampling okay. information from 
you know, different spot. My, my guess is somebody has been up hand and brush before mm -hmm. and done some kind of fish sampling that may exist. Um, so I have that one thought. And then in terms of, in terms of impact of the discharge of sediment on the stream, my guess is it was really relatively minor, you know, in terms of how that sediment going into the stream would have impacted the biological community. It, it maybe have occurred at a different time than the stream would normally get a uh, big flush of turbidity, but probably pretty limited in area before it kind of like, um, before it kind of uh, got diluted out essentially. And then rivers are used to dealing with this, these kinds of loads, sediment loads. Um, but, you know, that doesn't eliminate the fact that it happened. So, you know, I think maybe, I think maybe an assessment of, you know, if ways that the different landowners in the area could work together to work on stream health would be nice, but, um, but to implement much, maybe beyond the scope of the environmental damage in the case of the sediment going river. Um, I think focusing on the slope repair and the EBW, um, if it, you know, if it needs work after this flood event, uh, or really what we should focus on at this point. But again, like Al said, there's a lot of natural deposition that occurred in the BBW, or if Hannah Brook decided to, you know, cut a new meander that goes through that restoration area, that was like, well, okay, you know, like, that's what the river wants to do, that's what the river's gonna do, you know. And then we can reassess once the water comes down again. Yep. All right, so it sounds like the consensus is hold off for now for making any decision. Likely interest in pursuing some sort of assessment of improvements that could be done, but let's wait and see what it looks like after conditions decide. Do you feel comfortable hearing from Brian? Brian, you can go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I'd like to I concur with the two statements from the gentleman prior. Um, I wanted to say that, you know, it's evident by the photos today and just the meandering oxbows of the river that it is a natural floodplain with sediment moving constantly. That's that's the nature of this type of stream. And I, I think the events that occurred today far supersede any potential damage that had occurred um, from the work site. I, I think, in my opinion, what we're comparing is long gone in a and obliterated in terms of trying to find a baseline. Um, but uh, that's already been mentioned, so I won't repeat things. All right, so I think we have a path forward. Cassie is going to keep us updated first and foremost. And we will no doubt have a lot more information by the next meeting, if not before. Okay, and then for the, for the slope repair plan that was submitted, if I get all those changes, likely we'll be able to accept it at least for the slope but i guess for the sediment piece we're really going to have to wait and see so right okay and i can send you a summary ryan of what was requested at least tonight tomorrow i can send them okay Do thank you, you. comments gary I, I just observed that the okay. thank you I just observed that the course of the stream is not Eighteen years that I've come and visited it has not actually changed all that much. So it's, it's not, again, it's not like this sort of constantly moving stream. And I don't really know why, <laughs> but it is it is different than a lot of other streams. Thank you. All right. So going back to agenda order. Yes. We had no requests for certificate of compliance. Uh, do we have updates on other enforcement actions, Kathy? Yes. So we'll start with item 6C. So I don't have, I didn't have this highlighted on my updates for the commission, but it was something that Commissioner August had reached out to me about and noted that um, 
we not we didn't finish the follow up with that project, and you drove Commissioner Algus drove by, and noted that there was a lot of vegetation, but it wasn't clear that the plantings had survived necessarily, that it was revegetated the way that the Commissioner sorry, had wanted. Back up. I, yeah, where sorry. are we talking I'm about? I'm so sorry. I don't know. <laughs> this is not really oh Lord, I'm so sorry. Yeah, exactly. It's been a minute. So. This is um, 476 East Street. Oh, is this the trees that were removed yes. at the line? Okay, okay, thank you. I'm yes. working now. Yes, so what the commission, I need to really, what needs to happen is that I need to be more prepared for the next meeting to kind of get and regather this all back up. But as a quick overview, my understanding is that where we left it was that the commission wanted those plantings to occur and then allow the area to revegetate. I need to look up at the details of that what was required by the commission were, then we were supposed to follow up and I apologize, I did not. So we need to figure out what the status of it is um, and then what the commission wants to be there, if what's there is what you want or is it not? So my plan is before the next meeting is to go out and get picture, new pictures um, of the area and then go from there and review the minutes from before. All right, thank you. Any others? Yes, sorry, I'm just making my note here. Okay, next one would be 93 Northampton Street Rear. Um, it's item 60. So the update for that one was that, let me see what I put in here. Okay, so at the last meeting, the commission agreed to have the historical BVW restoration begin in September. Um, and I have a note for myself to reach out to them in the fall, in August, really, in, in advance of that, to make sure they're ready to go in September. Um, I visited the site on July 5th in, you know, for doing the site visit for the peer review and confirmed that there were piles of cut and basic material in, in the upland area outside of the woods that were piled up. And I also, since that, when I updated this last, got a message from the project saying that they were working to remove those piles. So they might be gone by now. I need to double check with them if, they're, if they finish that or not. Um, but so that was the first go through of the invasive removal. And I think what now needs to happen is the commission come back and see how successful that was because it was a question of whether or not herbicides should be used. If it wasn't successful, then likely they will have to modify the plan to use them or prepare to use them. So Cassie, where were those found? They were along the woods in the... Um, at the field edge? At the field edge. So well above where the water would have... I would think so. Like I would think so, okay. not having seen it at all, but I would hope so because that would be like a lot. Okay, okay hold on. Okay, um, and then the last one for enforcement orders was 10 Industrial Parkway, so with, with uh, Mr. Dietz. So he gave me this following update, um, and I can show the pictures here in a second, but he sent this to me on the 6th. In the area between our silt fence and the undisturbed woods, we placed mulch and erosion control seed mix when you visited in the site in the springtime. The area has completely vegetated with um, erosion control grass and native weeds. We were not able to find the uh, find and plant the sweet fern before this happened. At this point, the area is well vegetated. It does not make sense to plant the sweet fern and have it completely have it compete with the weed the weed growing. Um, I would like to wait until September to allow the weeds to subside again, and we will plant the sweet fern at that time. Uh, let me know if that is an acceptable plan for the commission. We are currently working to add this new land to our existing special permit in stormwater management. Our plans are to stay over 100 feet away from the wetlands with our improvements. So there is behind the scenes other like planning board stuff that needs to happen because they didn't get those approvals before they did that big clearing as well. And there may be stormwater implications to this that I think will come up later. I need to get more details. But does the commission feel that that's amenable to wait to do sweet fern planting? Yes, I think they'll have better, well, Right now it's super rainy anyway, but in general, they should have better success if they wait until September. So that's fine as long as it's vegetated now, which it sounds like it is. Yeah, I can show you guys pictures if you want. Um, if you're comfortable that it's vegetated, I am. that's fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. Are we not at open today? Yeah, unless Jay, unless Jay has anything. Yeah, he was in contact with Russell today, and I just said uh, any concerns about uh, mowing in the next month or so, and we, uh, he got back to me and said it was good with him. I told him, you know, I'm going to be right away because it's pretty wet right now. Um, and he says, yeah, it's pretty buggy in there. So we'll just uh, wait a couple of weeks and see how it looks. But he's fine. The birds have hatched, I assume. Okay. So, so, no issues. Great. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Um, 
compliance updates, Cassie, which projects do we have news on? Yes, so let's see, we did 69 3 Loudville. Um, just generally, I think it's going to be more for next meeting because everybody who has open work is going to need to tell me how the status after this crazy rain. So I don't have anything right now for people, but um, I would say likely I'll have updates next week. Yeah, so. Any that we should be particularly concerned about given all of this rain that we'd want to get a look at sooner than later? Um, so I sent an email today to everybody to remind them that I need the report within 24 hours. I might have a better idea once I receive the reports. Okay. I mean, I would think, really? 50 Florence comes to mind, the solar project, though that was pretty much done. Um, and Cherry Street, I want to know how that one's doing. Um, though that infrastructure is in place, so that might be good. Um, and then obviously 6973 Loudville. The school is primarily completed, but I would like to hear from them on the status. And then everybody else. I'll be interested actually on the school to see how much water is in that basin because it's it was already holding a substantial amount of water, so it's it doesn't have the capacity that it should have. Right. I don't know if it might have overtopped or I'll be interested to see what happened there. Agreed. Um the only one that I was still receiving reporting from two would be the uh, the Eversource project there at the line near the river there. They were saying that the, my last latest report is that it's pretty much done. They they removed the matting and everything seemed to be stable. They're going to come for a COC soon, so it might be totally fine. But I will be reaching out to them, of course, as well. Check in on it because it's right next to the river, so that's going to be a hard one. I don't know when they'll be able to get down there safely to do the check, but that was a question mark for me. Did you um, receive any complaints on either of the solar projects? No. I believe someone is trying to reach you oh. about one of them. How so? Did, by I email or phone? Through DEP. That's all I know. Interesting. Well, and I don't I, know which one it would be. I know. That's hard. I can, oh, which solar project? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and there's multiple people at DEP that I've gone through. Well, I will. Right, this, this is coming through Mary. I forget Mary's last name. Yeah. Well, I'll check. I'll check my email. And then also, because sometimes. It depends. I've been reached out. People have reached out to DEP and then reached out to me, or DEP then reaches out to me. Yeah. But sometimes I don't think they do. So I can just call them myself and okay. ask, but I'll just check my email too for anything from her. And then, um, because I know I got that comment from Marion Grover for the KSTAR project. So I got, I've gotten emails from her in the past. No, this is. Is that who the same person or different? This is person? Mary Grover. Oh, this is Mary this is not Grover. A resident. This is DEP. Oh, what? Okay. Okay. Well, I'll call them. Okay. <laughs> I will call them. I will call Mary Grover from DP. Sorry. We had a comment received from Marion yeah, Grove earlier. I think I wrote it down as Grover mistakenly early. Ooh, okay. I'll figure it out, but that's good to know. Um, yeah. I think I know real quick. Any others that come to mind for folks that we might want to take a look at? I think we've touched on them. Most of these don't have anything significant that's open or right. undisturbed at this point. Yeah. Was this the East Hampton Animal Hospital done? Oh, I might need to remove that. Which one? Are you saying the agenda? Letter R. Yeah, oh, yep. Sorry. sorry. I'll take that off. Check it out. All right. Uh, meeting minutes. June 26th. I have a copy here if anyone wants to see them. But Sarah, I got your email, so I haven't corrected it with your error that you found in there. What was it again, the error that you found? Um, just the, the date. It said the date of the next meeting was June 26th, but the minutes were for June 26th. Yeah. So it should have okay. been the 7th and 10th. I can implement that change. Then I got the comments from Commissioner August, and those were implemented. So. Um, I can plan to implement Sarah's change. One, two, motion to accept the minutes with that additional correction. Motion to approve the minutes for the June 26 meeting with the correction stated. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor are weak? I was absent on the 26th. Okay. I think you still wrote it though. It's the one of the ministerial acts. Not uh, actually. We okay. used to. <laughs> we didn't use to, but okay. now we do. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I was not there either, but I will vote. Yes. Ryan. Aye. Carr. Aye. Whittemore. Aye. Aries, thank you.
uh, wetlands ordinance discussion, I think I have the same update from last week, which is that we are meeting again with the working group next Tuesday. The 18th, which I think is a Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so we will have hopefully more of an update after that, but things are continuing to move along um, much quicker than they have for the last 10 odd years, but still slower than we might hope someday. Um, but that's, that's all there is to say about that for now. Which brings us to number 10. Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor, please? Aye. August. Aye. Buttrick? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Carr? Aye. Whittemore? Aye. Thank you. It is 7.51. We are concluding the July 10th meeting of the East Hampton Conservation Commission. Our next meeting will be July 24th at 6. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Can you start there? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Billy, I just think in these public meetings, we should keep. This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers.